down, and his arm in the way. I know. I can't show you guys everything. You gotta get lost in the wilderness and your hand is stuck under a stone and you don't have a saw. Your wrist has the same two bends on it. You just cut right between them. You can cut your hand off without a saw. That's a free one. Case you need. No charge, right? No charge. Survival thing. Put a tourniquet on ahead of time. Yeah. Right. You'll be fine. There, there she is. Okay. Um, do we have anything in this roaster? I don't know if we do. No, they put it yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, where's that cast iron yeah. pan yeah. thing you were supposed to be doing? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, want to, I want to smell it. <laughs> so the hot was intimidating. Above the elbow, which is uh, right in there. To get to the humorous. <laughs> and then salt it. You guys familiar with collagen? That's something you guys are know about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not it's not a super common like household name. It, it's increasingly there. You know, you can go and spend a lot of money even on like collagen powder and such. Things like this are completely loaded with collagen. You're probably aware uh, the same is true with like chicken feet. Mm -hmm. right? uh, I would encourage you to keep your chicken feet. I also encourage you to peel them before you, you do anything with them. Peel the chicken first. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> rough for a challenge. <laughs> Now what? Yes. So we have two halves of the front shoulder. They're referred to as Austin butt, no. Austin butt and picnic. Very good. Gold stars all around. So the Boston butt is weird because obviously it's not the butt. Um, and we're in Oklahoma. I mean, go figure. <laughs> Called the Tulsa butt. The Tulsa butt. Now, the, um, the origins. Words into that name, at least I tell people this all the time, I might be making it up. No one's ever fact-checked me, I hope you guys don't. Sorry. But there was a time where, for a very long time in human history, there was no electricity and there was no refrigeration. And if you were to eat meat throughout the summer months, it would have had to have been killed and preserved with salt over the winter months. And and if that were the case, before there was any knowledge of science or, or culinary um, care at all, you would just bury whatever that meat was in salt and know that it was going to be preserved so that you have a protein source for the rest of the year for your family. And way back um, when ships were coming across the Atlantic from Europe, um, they would be on the ocean for weeks and weeks and weeks, and all those people had to eat. Um, and one of the ways they did that was by filling giant uh, barrels or butts uh, with hunks of pork and filling them with salt. And uh, of course, one of the major ports of call was, was Boston. And therefore, are you fact checking me? <laughs> <laughs> Knew it. There's always one. They had different sizes of barrels, but the barrel size that they put these in were called butts. Yes. So there, there we have the origins of the Boston butt. And of course, it's confusing because you know we understand like, and yet it's so. But that's that's how it got its name. Um, and to this day, I've never been fact checked. <laughs> Till Robbie did. No, it's spelled. It is spelled B U T T. Uh, it's not with an E on the end or anything like that. Boston. Boston. Boop. Heavy with a heavy Cockney accent. I have to ask. I really need to see a show of hands here. Who here thinks that Andy and I are Irish? Kevin picked us up at the airport. He's like, so, so you guys are like, like the Irish like butcher guys? I said, what? I said, yeah, I think everybody just understands that, that you guys are like the Irish butchers. 
which was like a first for me. We had never heard this from anybody. So I just, <laughs> just literally just kept, all right, all right. Wait, are you? <clears throat> well, I mean, not really. I mean, I'm sure I have some Irish, Irish like somewhere. Do you want us to be? Yeah. No, okay, but that, that actually brings up a good, a good question. No, I'm not like directly Irish. I may or may not be indirectly Irish. But I will say to you, part of the reason that Andy and I have been able to have as much fun as we have had during our kind of culinary uh, experience with the pig is because we do not have an allegiance to a tradition or a nationality that says, well, this is the way we've always done it. Even though much of what we do is kind of traditional, we are still children of the information age. And if we want to learn how the Italians do something, or the Spaniards do something, or the Portuguese do something, like we do. And so we take this one pig that we raise, and we will treat it in all of these different methods and manners, because since the beginning of time, at least as long as people have been eating pigs, they have been turning them into food. And there are so many different traditions and so many different directions that, that this pig can go in. It is, it is unique on the, on the homestead uh, because since pigs have been domesticated, they're the one animal that doesn't have a secondary purpose or even a primary purpose besides food. You know, you've got your hens and your, and your broilers. Your chickens have both meat and eggs. Your goats and your sheep have wool and, and hair and milk. Same is true with your, your cattle, whether it's dairy or oxen for pulling. Pigs are just raised or domesticated for food. And so no matter where you're at in the world, whatever culture you're in, unless you're Jewish or Muslim, you have centuries of tradition culinarily with pigs. So it is actually our kind of nimbleness uh, that has allowed us to go so many different directions with it. It would, have been, uh, it would have been a different thing if he or I grew up doing this. We probably would not be here today because we would just do it the way dad did it or granddad did it or whatever. And that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's also, it has so much versatility. We love the pig and what it has to offer. Any, uh, any questions while Andy takes the skin off of this uh, picnic? Super, every question has been answered. <laughs> Yeah, that, that would have been story. that would have been awesome. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we do have a chef story. We thought we were going to do that. That was our intention. Um, but when we started um, 11, 11 years ago, like twelve years ago, we started twelve years ago. Um, how many of you are familiar with Carla Emery's Encyclopedia of Country Living? A few folks. Okay. 11 or 12 years ago, if you were getting into homesteading or raising animals for yourself on your own property, like that was what you had. There were not books and there were not YouTube videos. There were not resources. Any of that stuff that you will find today, I promise you, has been published in the last 10 years. It, is, it has been an incredible renaissance um, during our experience doing this. We would have given anything to learn like you guys are from people that actually know what they're doing. And we didn't have that opportunity. Um, even, even commercial butchers do a very different thing than what we're doing here uh, in both their methodology uh, approach, but also, again, that nimbleness isn't there. Um, so, to answer your question, we, ah, uh, gosh, I was, I was working as a contractor at the time. I was um, finishing a restaurant, and the chef at that restaurant found out that I lived on a homestead raised pigs. And he said, I'll tell you what, if you raise a pig for me, I will come out and teach you how to butcher it and turn all of it into charcuterie. This is 12 years ago, and my mind was blown. I'm like, oh, you're on. Let's do it. And so I did. I raised four pigs that year, and one of them, one of them went to this guy that uh, is no longer a chef, but that's not here nor there. I mean, it kind of is here and there. But he came out, and we went uh, into my cellar where we had been butchering pigs for a couple years at that point, but, but very insecure. What we were doing, how we were doing it. No, no was that the first year. Was it? I thought we skinned our first pigs. Oh, they yeah, were skinned. We were skinned. That's right. Uh, we started skinning our pigs. We have asked for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> so he came out. His name was Bill. 
Chesterfield. He drove a uh, hot rod with his license plate was New Muscle. <laughs> in you. Bill shows up, comes in my basement. We're in my old, uh, century old farmhouse in the cellar. And he goes to work. He gets out all his knives. He's doing a sharpening thing. And, and Andy and I are videoing everything we can because this is going to be the thing that is going to teach us what we need to know. And we didn't know for years later that the guy was a complete hack. Like he was, yeah, no, it was like fake it till you make it. And we didn't know better. We didn't know to call him out on anything. So everything he was doing, he just couldn't make it look like he was a hack. So Andy loves talking about the story because this guy would cut it, set his knife down, he would cut it, look at it, fold it, and come around and cut it some more. And it was as though, it was, awesome. it was as though he's had this relationship with this cut of meat. Uh, and the meat was telling him what to do, but he, he did not have any knowledge. And so we knew at that point we couldn't replicate it, either. even though we didn't know he was a hack. Um, that's a mean thing to say. I guess what I mean is uh, he was a shyster. <laughs> that's, that's what I mean. He told us he knew how to do a thing and he didn't know how to do a thing. And then I gave him a pig in exchange for his lack of knowledge. Anyway. Um, that is as close as we got to learning from somebody. So what we did is, uh, when we started, we skinned our first hog, uh, and it was a mess. Um, skinned hogs are messy to butcher, like everything about it. Everything sticks to the fat. If you've ever skinned a deer, you understand that everything sticks to the hide. There's hair everywhere, anything, anything like that. Rabbit, squirrel, whatever. Same is true with a pig. With the skin on, scalding and scraping, which takes some knowledge and some skill, but mostly you just have to care. You just have to care enough to follow through. You can get a clean hot. You can get a clean hot. So every single pig we did for the first four years, we did different than the pig before. We were continually trying to do something better than we did the lot of the time before. Um, remembering the stuff that worked for us, but then the stuff that didn't work, we would try other things. So it was just a really low, slow, slow and long arc or learning curve. Um, Today, you can get on YouTube and learn just about anything you want to about butchery. Uh, so why are you here? Hopefully, uh, it's because <coughs> that stuff doesn't actually scratch the itch, or it's intimidating. A lot of that stuff, um, a lot of those butchers or YouTube personalities that are also butchers. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> There's a certain like Gnosticism that, that's there. It's like shrouded in mystery, you know? Like the butcher is this guy who's like this highly skilled artisan and you're never gonna, you're never gonna get behind the curtain and know the wizard, you know? And we try to dispel all of that. We want all of this to be accessible to you. We want you to know that you can go home and do this. And if you know already how to cook food, then you should be able to butcher this pig. I mean, pretty, pretty easily, pretty handy. Um, so you'll hear us over and over again talk about cookery just as much as butchery because that's actually why we raised the animal in the first place. It's to eat it. It's to make it yummy. And then once you go down that road just a little bit, you realize all the different directions it could go. We've been doing this 12 years and with combined it's 24 years of experience, we've done so many different things every single season, every single pig. We haven't even begun like Asian cuisine or Korean barbecue. There's so much still that we haven't even gotten into yet. Um, but all of it is yummy, <laughs> and that should be its, its end goal. Um, as far as learning or learning how to do it well, I would tell you just care. Just care. Just care enough to do it. We were at a workshop not long ago in Virginia where we were scalding and scraping and getting this hog clean, and they had been doing that there at their place for years. And they had never finished the job. They got really, really close. And then they would just like give up and skin it. And so they had us down there, we did a workshop. It actually was for the Homesteaders of America conference. And we went to this farm right outside of that town. And the guys that were there that, that kind of did the hog killing year after year, they were like, that's it. All we had to do was just keep going. Like we were so close, we didn't know. Because they had never seen it done all the way through. So they just kind of gotten all the way to the finish line and then just throwing their hands up. Yeah, they thought they were doing something wrong. In truth, they just didn't have quite the stamina or vision to, to follow through with it. 
Um, but if you care, you're already halfway there, easily. Yes? So I think the intimidating part is knowing where to make the cuts and where not to make the cuts. Have you guys produced any literature at all on, on that process? Are you not paying attention? I'm not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Come on, Daryl. No. There, there Clearly, a, I'm as not. Far, no, as far as like where to make the cuts, the, the question is always, well, what are you after? So for example, um, if you want a boneless chop, it's gonna be a very different process than a, a bone-in chop. Or if you're a family of two versus a family of seven, that cut should be different, right? So every, every single one of those cuts should be about what is its intended use or purpose. I, I, I understand that part. For example, the scapula, I know, he knows it's in there somewhere, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but how do you know how to cut around it? Sure. I mean, it's not visible. Sure. So some of that stuff, you're 100% correct. There is some like muscle memory or knowledge of the skeleton of the animal yep. and where bones sit, even though you can't see them. Now, what we were, what we have demonstrated here, is pretty close to to blind man's ignorant cutting. You don't have to know anything. He went through the meat and then he saw where there was bone. Right. So, in other words, where there was tricky stuff, like in the picnic, all of that came off the bone. All of it. Right, so he yeah. didn't have to have a special knowledge or skill. You're, you're right, some of those are very very easy to see. Once mm -hmm. he's done it, it's very clear. Mm -hmm. Some of them are not. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Agreed, this is gonna take some hands-on. Sure, yeah, and, and also, the, the hands-on is absolutely critical. Um, and we didn't really appreciate that as much as we should have. We, when we started hosting workshops, uh, we thought people just wanted to see us or know how it was done. But the feedback that we've gotten was, oh no, the idea that the knife was in my hand and yep. I was the one doing the job, that was invaluable to people. Yep. Um, which I guess is, is meaningful and rewarding for us. Um, but we, we also want to make sure that it's understood that you can't screw anything up. And like this pile right here, let's say he meant to do something and he, and it was a, he got devastating results. He wanted a picnic ham for his family. It's gonna be Christmas ham, for crying out loud. And he screwed it up. And now all he ends up with is sausage, right? Now the sausage is still delicious, right? But it wasn't the picnic ham he wanted. So like that's as close as you can get to screwing up. And to your credit, you guys have made that abundantly clear. You can't Good. screw it up. So that's, that, that is a that's great point. Good. And, and, and that's, that's appreciated. Yeah, there, there shouldn't, there shouldn't, I mean, I don't know if you guys can see this. This is, this is the waste from this one, this one pig. Right? And that's like mostly, <laughs> that's mostly like the bloodshot stuff from where the neck goes. I was goes. telling someone earlier, that could go to a liverwurst, if yeah. there's a liverwurst. There, there, shouldn't, there shouldn't be waste from anywhere on the animal. You know, whatever there's left over, let's say, let's say he was careless cutting the, what remains of the scapula. He was careless and he left a bunch of meat on. That goes in the stock pot. And then I get both stock and meat from it. So there's not, yeah. Yeah, if you're intimidated, don't be. And the main reason for that is, if you're intimidated, you're never going to start. Right. If you never start, you're never going to get good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the comfort level of cutting up is something, you know, and a lot of folks have already broken down some animal or two, you know, or many in their life. Um, some comfort with a knife in your hand is important. Um, you know, if I've never played a fish before, I'd feel a little different about taking the skin off of that. But when we take the skin off of that, it's the same thing. I take my flexible boning knife, I hold the skin, and I fillet that skin right off the fat, you know? <laughs> and if I hadn't filleted a fish, maybe it would feel a little clunky, you know, a little awkward. Um, and some of that is just experience, but, but by and large, it's all food. I used to give uh, Andy's dad a hard time because he'd get a hog every year, and all of it would go to grind. Like, even the belly. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, like, the, what would have been bacon is all going to like grind. Sausage. Yeah. And then it's, the, the thing is, he likes sausage, you know? And like, who, who am I, you know? Who am I to say, no, you shouldn't do that? And, and in truth, for my own family, I can tell you the most versatile thing that my wife or I pull out of the freezer is ground pork. That's true. Like, if I pull out, if I pull out chops, it's because we're having pork chops, right? If I pull out a, a smoked hock, it's because we're gonna have hock and beans. And I could go on and on and on. If I pull out ground pork, it can go in so many different directions. And so there's a versatility there. And, and it's also a last minute thing. That's a, it's an interesting point too, is it, I'm 61 years old and 
you know, 40 years ago, we take a deer to get it processed and invariably you'd have them mix pork with it mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. make it better. That's right. That's you don't exactly look a day right. over 25. Say again? I said you don't look a day over 25. Yeah, all right, thanks. I appreciate that. I'll pay you later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, that, that does bring up a good point. This was not a fatty pig. If you raise fatty pigs, keep your fat. Now you can render it and use it, and I encourage you to do that. But you know, if you raise pigs, especially heritage pigs, a couple at a time for a few years, you will end up with more fat than you can use. If you save your fat, cube it up, put it in your freezer, anytime you get a deer, or anytime you have lean ground beef, add your back fat to it, and it will be better because of it. <coughs> it, is, it, is, it is almost as versatile as the sausage itself. What else? Good question. Um, historically, we have ground the back fat and then frozen it like that. Uh, and and that's, that's a little bit because managing already ground fat is kind of unwieldy, uh, especially if it's frozen. <coughs> but if it's, um, we often will flash freeze it <coughs> on a pan so that when it goes into a bag, uh, it's already frozen individually, like little chunks. You can like break them off much easier. Um, and then also it's easier to apportion that way, depending on how you do venison or ground beef, you can throw a few chunks in, into the grinder as you're grinding the, the chunks of meat. When you feed them, do you feed them blood for anything? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. We'd like to know what? Yeah, so we, uh, we have several different recipes that we use the blood for. Again, um, we're just like dudes from Ohio and yet we use this, recipe from Finland um, where they make a blood pancake which is pretty interesting with buckwheat flour um, in, um, in Spain uh, which is our preferred utilization of blood sausage they make a, a morcilla uh, which is a, a, a Oreo rice um, and, and peppers and onions um, bomba if you if you have bomba available for um, and, and we poach it, and then after it's cooked, we'll cut it to cross sections and sear it in a skillet, and it's delicious. Uh, in Italy, uh, we employ a recipe called sanguinaccio, sanguinaccio, which is equal parts blood and sugar and cream. Um, and it's, it's a literal uh, pudding, like a chocolate pudding uh, with cocoa. And uh, if you ate it and didn't know that blood was a binding agent in it, you would just think you're eating chocolate pudding. Um, sanguinaccio. Yeah, there are, a, there are a number of different utilizations of the blood. Um, and again, like, I, we also understand, like, we, we come from, we live in the, in the middle of the largest Amish settlement in the world. And in that community, the idea of consuming blood is, like, off limits. Like, they're not going to do it. And I understand that, and I respect that. Uh, but I also know that there was a time where you did not just let this blood spill on the ground. It was food and, and mineral rich and to be consumed. If if we ever did a hog killing, actually we're, we're going to this, this summer, we were just invited uh, to do a, a hog killing with a hog, um, uh, very similar to this. Um, anyway, we would encourage those folks to keep the blood just the same. Even if they're not gonna keep it, uh, it can be turned into blood meal uh, for their compost. Um, it can be uh, mildly diluted and then sprayed on your fruit trees to keep the deer away. There are a number of different uses for blood besides just consuming it. How exactly do you harvest all this blood? I mean, you shot it, it was laying on the ground, mm -hmm. and you stabbed it. Mm -hmm. You already did like hung upside down. Mm -hmm. No, um, after the pig is is dropped to the ground, in this case, it was happened to be sleeping. Um, but after the shot, um, there's a, about a half a minute where its heart is still beating in its chest. And if the stick is effective, then all the blood will be expressed from a very small stick wound. Um, so Andy's stick wound is incredibly small. It's, it's not even an inch wide. Exactly. If he opened it wide open, then it would just spill out onto the earth, which is fine. But if we wanted to keep it uh, for some culinary use, a small cut, high blood pressure, good stream, and a bowl, stir it. If you don't stir it, it will coagulate and congeal. So you've got to have a bowl and a spoon and just keep stirring and stirring and stirring until all the platelets kind of equalize. How much difference is there in what the raw pig compared to 
wild pigs versus domestic pig. Uh, difference as far as flavor or carcass or just in general. Yeah, the number one thing that you need to be uh, aware of, especially uh, Oklahoma and, and South, because um, wild, pig, wild pigs are prevalent, uh, you need to be aware, uh, if you're not already, that there is a uh, pretty nasty little parasite um, called trichinosis. And, and trichinosis um, is carried by pigs, but you are the end host, and, uh, and you don't want to be. It's uh, bad news, and so, um, because it's an actual parasite that's inside the, the flesh of the pig, um, it would also be in your flesh should you eat that pig. Um, that is why the 165 degree temp was specced by the USDA. Um, now, pigs aren't fed meat in the industry. So sorry, pigs are omnivores and um, they'll eat anything. And if they eat an animal that has that parasite in it, then they pass it on to you. So if you, eat, if you consume wild pigs, um, make sure that you freeze that meat first. And it's like a hard freeze. If you have specific questions. If you're gonna be curing it. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're not, yeah, if you're, if you're gonna be curing it or undercooking it. Um, but yeah, there are ways to eradicate the parasite, even if it's in it. One of them is cooking it to a certain temperature, the other is freezing it to a certain temperature. Uh, we do a lot of curing, and so that meat is never cooked. No cheese is never cooked. So if we were wanting to cure a pig that was wild and maybe had a uh, parasite in it, or the tr tr kind of parasite, we would have to freeze it first. So. What do I do with the curve? Yeah, that's what I was getting at. So the USDA has a curve uh, where you can see if you can only bring your, tip, your freezer down to four degrees in this many days. Or if you can get like negative 10 in your freezer this many days. And so there's an arc and a curve and a line uh, that would explain it in better detail than I can. Uh, but there is a way to get wild pigs and, and consume them safely. Um, but I will tell you that, uh, who's heard of boar taint? Anybody boar taint? Okay, wild pigs are not necessarily boars. Boy pigs are boars. Adult boy pigs are boars. Um, and, and adult boy pigs, even if they're domesticated, can still have boar taint. Uh, wild pigs, they're probably more prevalent. Taint is a insidious genetic disposition that makes the, the, the pork uh, unpalatably funky. Uh, it reeks of um, scent glandy stuff um, that you'll you'll not have to wonder if the pig is tainted. Um, Women are usually more sensitive to the yeah, smell too. That's correct. And if you if you don't know ahead of time um, that, that this pig that you just killed or harvested, even if it's domesticated, let's say you had an intact boar that you raised, heritage pig, not a wild pig, uh, if it's an intact boar, meaning it still has its testes, uh, it may have boar taint. And uh, I would encourage you to take a little bit of the meat before you butcher it uh, and just throw out the skillet. And then you'll know immediately, uh, if it doesn't stink out the house, then you'll probably be fine to butcher it the next day. But if it stinks, then you'll know it's gonna be dog food. So when you're raising those, do you castrate I do, <laughs> yeah. If it's, a, if it's a boy pig, um, I castrate, I usually do it, uh, <laughs> I don't know, what, four to six weeks? We wait longer than most people do. A lot of people do it within days. I think we've got one at home that needs a castrate. Yeah, I've got like a 60 pounder right now. It's gonna be a little bit of a fight. Um, <laughs> my, my bad. Um, we've been busy. busy. Um, yeah, so if you castrate your pigs, um, it's not a hard thing to do, it's not a fun thing to do. But if you castrate your pigs, then you can eradicate the possibility of more pig And this pig was a male pig that had been castrated. Correct. Which makes it a pharaoh. Yes. If you don't have a uh, space to hang it, uh, you know, 24 hours or more, can you cut it into prime molds and put it in the fridge? Yep. Is that what you would recommend? Yep. yep. As long as it's below 40, um, then yes. The only thing I would say is, um, let's say you have an extra fridge in the basement of the garage or whatever, which is better than the, the household fridge just because you cut a whole hog up into primals and you'll have to clean your whole fridge out first. I mean, like no ketchup, like everything's gotta be out of there. It's gonna be a lot of real estate. Um, the only thing is if it's not hanging, then you won't have air circulating around it. And if air isn't circulating around it, that's fine. It's just gonna be a softer, squishier experience than this rigid setup meat on the table. That's all. 
it's still fine, it's still below 40, but if you wonder why it's like, not slimy, but wet, that's why. It just didn't have the air circulating around the whole time. Next question. Say, okay, so uh, the question was, do we do any round steaks? Um, so as far as like nomenclature is concerned, round is the term given to the back end of a beef. So there's the, the round on the back end and the chuck on the front end, and then the loin and the plate and the rib. Um, so the round is like the ham of a beef. Um, and then from that round, you can get a top round, a bottom round, an inside round, uh, eye of round, all of that is from the back leg of the, of the beef. Um, a lot of those are leaner cuts, um, and if I were to do a, a round, oftentimes, I would either treat it like roast beef, uh, or I would sous vide it, as we talked about earlier with the vacuum bag, which is really nice, or wrapped in bacon. It's done perfectly. It's fine. As long as it's, uh, as long as it's perfect, it'll be okay. Don't be intimidated. Just yeah, just, yeah it's, it's, it's exactly right. Um, so as far as scalding is concerned, you treat it very similarly to a chicken. You drop this whole hog into water about 150 degrees, very similar to scalding a chicken. Um, we usually aim between 146 and 151, um, something in that range. Um, we have three or four different methods by which we scald the pig, so it can be done any different way. Um, but the idea is, you have it in there, let's say it's 149 degrees, dip it in there two and a half minutes, pull it up, chain hoist or block and tackle or whatever you've got, and then we'll put these bell scrapers, start scraping it, and if the hair and the scurf, which is like the outside epidermal layer, come off together easily without cutting into the skin, then your scald is right. Now, at 149 for two and a half minutes, you're not going to cut into the skin. Uh, if it's not coming off as easy as you want, put it down for 30 or 40 seconds and hoist it back up again. It's better to do it that way than to overcook it, and then when you go to scrape it, the skin will be too soft, you'll be carving into it, and then you'll feel terrible because you won't feel like you know what you're doing and this will be a sloppy mess because the skin's all hacked up. Now, it'll still be fine. Everything's still fine. It just won't give you the confidence that you need. So instead, do a little bit, two and a half minutes, it and try it. In fact, for those of you that were here yesterday for the actual kill, you guys remember the time and temp? 150 for how long? Two and a half. Okay, and did we put it back down? Okay, so that was what we needed. Okay, that's variable. It's variable on time of year. So, like, if you like, we hate doing hogs in September. We hate it because it's when they're going like into their winter hide and it, they just don't want to scald and scrape the same. So some of it is time of year, some of it is breed, etc. But if you start around 150, two and a half minutes, you'll be, it's a good place to start. Good luck. Sure. Our lovely assistant, Kevin here, is gonna go in the back and grind this fat. This fat is, is mostly the leaf fat. Because this pig doesn't have a lot of fat, we're putting all the fat together just to make things easier. Um, but it's been in the freezer, so it's really, set up well. Kevin's going to go in the back and grind it, and it's going to go into this roasting pan to start the rendering process. That's what's happening here. Only because it's a loud grinder. Thank you. We think it's a real loud grinder. And then this bus tub, I'm just kind of going over a couple things. This bus tub is all the stuff we would put into our stock pot. So it's got the feet, pieces of skin, bones, the heads are down in here, part of the humerus. <laughs> Um, I did put the rib tips in this just to make things a little bit simpler. Some of the backbone where we took uh, the loin off. So this is like things that are going to go into a stock pot to make broth. And then after that process, any meat that's on it, you know, after we've cooked it for about three hours, I think Doug went over this, then we would pull off all that meat and use it for whatever other purpose we want to use it for. This is going to go back in the cooler for now and then we're going to get the ham. Yeah. And all the ground pork, the stuff that will be ground, that I just took off the, the picnic, I put it with the other ground, but stuff that will be ground, and our, our people in the back are gonna be grinding it while we work on the ham. 
And again, it's not, we're not putting it back there because it's mysterious. It's just the noise we want to keep at a minimum. Fun little uh, culinary experiment. Take all these things and put them in a pot of water, the head, skin, trotters, tail, bones, etc. Put them in a pot of water, put in your aromatics and whatever you want to put in your stock. You cook that down. And then when you're ready, you pull the meat off so you can reuse it. Put the rest of the stuff back in that and just keep cooking it. At that point, you can boil it. If you boil it pr prior, the meat will get too mushy and tacky and you won't like to chew it. <laughs> I think that's going to keep happening. He's going to probably talk trash about me and he won't know that he might. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can hear it. Yeah, we can. I didn't say anything about it. Did you take the eyeballs out? No, we did not take the eyeballs out. No. I have a 19th century cookbook, and it says to know when your hog's head is done, mm -hmm. it's halfway done when the eyeballs fall out. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> it may be BS, but it doesn't matter. It's, who's going to verify it, right? It's like, who's going to fact check them? <laughs> this guy, he's going <laughs> to. Okay, so if you take that pot of water, your stock pot, and you pull all the meat off of it, you put everything back in, and you have it on a rolling boil now, all you're doing is evaporating the water from your stock. And by evaporating the water from your stock, you're concentrating your stock. And you can keep doing that. 50%, 75%, 80%, until what remains in the bottom of that stock pot is pure collagen. Gelatin. It, it, it becomes it gelatin, and it will set up like a solid. And I don't mean like a jelly. I mean like a solid. You can actually carve it in the shape of a ball and bounce it on the floor. Like, it is incredible. We've done and it. We have. Well, there was a night. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Was there alcohol involved? There's a camera up the spine. No. So, may have been there may have been alcohol. It may have turned into a ping pong tournament with a scapula and a jawline. <laughs> but what was amazing about it is if you concentrate it like that, then you basically are creating bullion, right? So, like little bullion cubes that then you can add into anything. Super rich, tacky, like even a simple plate of rice. If you were to add that to the rice, it'll be really sticky and, and oh, beautiful. Okay, the camera needs to see that. So that's what happens when fat is near frozen and ground well through near frozen plates. It should be nice and thick uh, and consistent, not schmeary. You don't want to, you don't want schmeary. Schmeary means your your grinder is working over over time. So he's going to put this in the roasting pan here. It's already warm. And it's going to be it is going to be on low for a little while. The reason it's going to be on low for a little while is because if it's up too high, then it'll start to burn and stick to the side walls. As soon as it starts to liquefy, you can turn the temp on, and it'll be floating and, and rendering out. Is that all the fat from that one? It is. We we mix all the fat from the pig only because the, the leaf was so small and there was such a minimal amount of other fat. So this is still going to be really really nice cooking lard, but maybe not baking lard. Um, and hopefully it smells like pee, so you guys can experience that. <laughs> How do you preserve the collagen? I assume you have to refrigerate it. Yeah, we end up we end up freezing it after it's after it's uh, in that in that steak. Yeah. Um, I, I don't. I'm sure you probably even have to at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You said that was about 20 percent left. Okay, yeah. yeah, I would say uh, 70 would be minimal. Yeah, 70% reduction minimally, yeah. And once you get there, once you get to 70%, it will be obvious. And if you, if you, this is my, my or this is our test. Uh, you take a spoon, just a dinner spoon, you scoop it down in there, you let it cool off because it's boiling. And once it does, if you go to taste it and it coats the entire, the entirety of your mouth, then you'll know that it's in that tacky, lip smacking, you know, umami, it's wonderful. If you go a little bit more than that, then you're sure that it's going to set up solid. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great question. Yeah. Great question. Generally speaking, uh, if I were to take those hams and grind those, they would be too lean, and we would have needed some of that fat. That's why the picnic is just perfect because the picnic has all the perfect ratios of the fat and the lean to the to the sauce and grind. Yes. Oh, I'm just gonna do it all. Oh, okay. You're oh you're doing the other method? Okay. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah, okay. 
So Andy is going to take the H file. How do you spell that? Damn. So he's removing the H bone only. This time he's going to do it uh, the way that I often do without removing that uh, sacral of the joint. Um, and he's going to take it out in its entirety. He's still going to start the same way. You remove that little bit of, what's it called? The pupius shooteus. The special yeah. muscle? Yes, the special muscle. Um, the, the oyster, uh, so called. That's already been removed, and now he's going to start down at the femur until he finds the ball, and then and then go from there. Ball's right there. Ball in. Where's supposed to be on there? It comes and goes. Okay. I haven't even noticed it. He's going to need some paper towels. Don't be too square. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so that answered all the questions. We are comprehensive. Yes. Okay, so I'm wondering how it has to be like that. Yeah, so um, we had the sheets of leaf fat that we pulled off the belly, and then some of the back fat that was taken from the skin when he was doing that portion, probably near the shoulder. All of that got just cut up into strips or chunks, and that is for ease of the grinder. So I didn't talk about this because it's super uh, esoteric, but there's a, there's a membrane on the leaf fat. It's called the peritoneum. The peritoneum will wrap around the cutter head of your grinder if your grinder is super sharp or the fat is super cold. And if you cut it into chunks, it's less likely to get bound up around your, your auger and your cutter head of your grinder. So we usually chop it up into sections, freeze it, and then pass it through the, the auger. <coughs> oh, I see, indefinitely. Yeah. Like, so you're not gonna grind it and, and render it yet. You're gonna put it away, which is not a bad idea. If you did several hogs at a time, and then you finally did one large batch of lard, um, at that point, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't think twice of just chunking it up. And then we have a vacuum sealer. Um, I mean, we didn't for a lot of years, and so we probably use Ziplocs. Um, you guys already know that if you put meat or anything in Ziplocs, you don't get the air out. There's going to be freezer burns, so just be thoughtful of that. Um, but yeah, we would vacuum seal it, label it, and put it in the put it in the freezer, and then get around to it, which happens all the time. Like we have so much fat in freezers labeled for different uses. Great question. So, uh, about about the rendering. So it's been partially frozen to make life easier on the grinder, and then we ground it, and that's what you just saw on the bus cut. And now it's in the roaster on low until it liquefies. Once it liquefies a little bit, we'll turn it up. Once it turns up, it'll render even faster. Once it is entirely liquid, it'll bubble for a little while, and that bubbling is actually moisture that's in the fat. The fat doesn't have a ton of moisture, but it has some, and that moisture is water. And you don't want, if you want it to be shelf stable, you need that water to leak. The, the reason that you can use a slow roaster to make shelf stable product instead of a pressure canner is because oil can go way higher than water can. So you can be at several hundred degrees until all of that water has left the lard. And so at, at some point, we'll actually cock the lid of that to make sure all the vapors can escape. Once it stops boiling, we know that all the water is gone. I say boiling, I mean like teeny little bubbles come up. Once the water leaves that and stops bubbling, we now know it's shelf stable and ready to be transferred into, we just have little plastic vessels with lids. Like yogurt containers? Yeah, they look like yogurt containers basically. They're transparent, but they could, it would be better if they weren't. Once they're in those containers, um, we'll label it if it's leaf fat or you know just rendered lard. And then a date, just for our own knowledge, but it's like, the other day, I was, what did I, was I cooking the other day? I cooked out a bunch of stuff with lard. It was labeled like 2019. You know, his fine. It was leaf fat. It had no odor or smell to it whatsoever. Um, didn't think anything of it. It was perfectly fine. And that was years old. Now, it is in a cooler. Um, we have a walk in cooler. If you had a fridge or a cellar, it would probably be fine there. Um, but I would say that if you, you, what you want to avoid is sunlight. Any kind of fat that's exposed to ultraviolet light will get rancid. It means it'll turn yellow, 
and there'll be like a metallic taste to it. It's real it doesn't thin. mean you can't eat it. Yeah, it's okay to eat. You just won't like it. So, like when we like when we have a prosciutto, for example, uh, we'll let it sit out on a prosciutto stand or hang in our shop for years until we get around to it. It'll have yellow fat around the perimeter. We'll take our knife. We'll trim around, just shaving, you know, a quarter eighth inch, and it'll be white fat underneath. So it's just that yellow fat you want to avoid because of the rancidity. So if it gets rendered, same thing, make sure it's dark, be fine. Anybody else? When it comes to curing specifically? Yeah, like when you get the prosciutto and it hangs there for a year before you eat it. Yeah. Are there some things that just stand out and say, you yes. know, works? Yes. Yes, there are. Um, it's a big hunk of meat that's not cooked. So you'll know if it's bad. Yeah, Andy's a big hunk of meat. Um, you'll know if it's bad because it'll be rotten. And you won't have to call me and ask is this meat rotten. You know what I mean? It'll be like roadkill hanging in your kitchen. Um, that's, that's one of the wonderful things about whole muscle curing, which, as opposed to grinding like a salami. If it's a whole muscle, meaning a giant piece of meat that's been cured and aged, it, it, it's either going to be good or it's going to be wildly bad. And um, there's like you won't have to know to look for it. It'll be rotten meat hanging. And that should never happen, and we'll talk about that at length tomorrow. But um, we got a, a, every weekend of the fall and winter, we get people reaching out to us with the funniest questions through text and email and Facebook message. It's the greatest. It's often people like showing us pictures of their slimy meat and they're like, what do I do with this? And oftentimes, uh, it's as simple as this was a ham laying like this with salt on it and the salt pulled the water out and the water laid there on the ham and when they went to hang it up it was like a slimy slurry coming off the ham and they freak out about it understandably and they reach out to us and we say well, what does it smell like I'm like well it smells like roast pork for whatever reason she said like roast pork i'm like well i like the smell of roast pork i don't know like that would that would give me no indication that that's bad uh, but little things like that happen all the time uh, mold. Mold is another one. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. You're skipping away. Ahead. No, I'm not because we only have 45 minutes to talk about curing tomorrow. Uh, so a lot of these things are not, we're not going to have time to address tomorrow. Mold happens. Mold is going to end up on whatever meat you cure in age. You should turn that into bumper stickers. Mold happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the worst thing that you can ever do is, is try to make a prosciutto and, uh, and then six months, eight months later, um, check on it and find out that it has mold on it and then throw it away. If you do that, then you're no friend of ours. Uh, mold, like moss, just grows on the outside of the thing. It's like mold, moss on a rock. It's not inside that meat. It's growing on that meat. And of course it is. It's a damp, healthy, organic matter. So it's like a perfect environment for mold to grow. Um, mold is superficial and grows on the outside of something. In certain ways, the mold is very beneficial because if you want this hunk of meat to dry slowly over time to develop character and flavor, you want that moisture to leave the meat slowly. And one good way to do that is to give it a moldy sweater. And that mold <laughs> absorbs the moisture of both the ham and the air around it and slowly releases the moisture in the ham. And so it has its own benefits. Um, do not be scared of mold. Um, you shouldn't inhale mold. That's bad for you. Um, and you never eat the mold that's on the outside of that meat anyway. It, almost all the meats that we have, with a few exceptions, like a prosciutto, have a casing around them. That casing is what has the mold on it, not the meat. The casing comes off and you eat the salami or you eat the capicola or whatever it is. You eat the piece of meat without the casing and mold on it. If you have a bunch of funky mold growing on a prosciutto, and you will, that's okay. If it makes you uncomfortable, spritz it with some wine or vinegar. Rub it off. Scrape it off with a knife. It'll be gone. 
if we had if we had a piece of, of moldy prosciutto in front of in front of me right here, and I could show you, I could take off my knife and, and either do this number or cut the most superficial amount of mold off, and you would see clean, pure meat immediately under it. So mold does not mean bad meat. It means that organic matter is growing on top of organic matter in a damp, humid environment. So it should be expected, not feared. Now, there are certain things like people will say, well, this color mold is good and this color mold is bad. I'm not even gonna get into all that. That's, a little bit of that is, again, some of that like wizard behind the curtain stuff. Like, well, you don't know, you people don't know, and so you're gonna be scared and not do it. You're gonna trust me to do it for you. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. Mold is okay on a hunk of meat that you're gonna be aging. In fact, I don't know that we've ever, ever in 12 years aged a piece of meat that didn't have mold growing on it. Ever. If you're just out on the farm, what do you recommend to hang meat? I'm sure you guys have a shop that is specific for sure. that. But, but we didn't always, of course. Right. 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 Yeah, so um, the, the perfect conditions for aging uh, meat are whatever you would find in any cave, spring house, root cellar, Think about it, this has literally been done for centuries, arguably millennia, without controlled environments. But if it's damp and cool with air exchange, it's fine. So anything like a spring house, 50 degrees, 80% humidity, ideal. Do they have spring houses in Oklahoma? You guys have spring houses here? Yeah. Is like a Midwestern yes. thing? Okay. Uh, also, um, so we would have uh, root cellars. You guys have tornado shelters. <laughs> but I'm only kind of kidding. If you have a tornado shelter that's underground, it's gonna be 50 degrees. And by virtue of it being underground, it's gonna be damp. If there's any amount of air exchange there, it's probably an ideal place to hang meat. <coughs> 70 to 90, yeah. Yeah, a, a, a prosciutto leg, and again, I, I really don't want to go too far down the road because we, are, we have a dedicated talk about it tomorrow to answer all the questions in a very comprehensive manner. But I will say that a prosciutto is very forgiving because it's surrounded by skin and fat. And that skin and that fat is going to be protecting the meat from over drying. What about bugs? Bugs. We don't eat I don't really eat them. Um, well, I mean, like, how do you keep the, the flies and stuff off the meat when you're... Yeah, so there is a, uh, there's a long and storied tradition of, uh, of either black pepper or red pepper flakes on your, your hanging meat, whether it's a country ham or even a prosciutto. Um, flies don't like pepper, and so it may or may not impart any flavor to the meat, but if you, while it's aging, uh, if it has pepper on it, flies are probably not going to bother it. One thing I would remind you of, which is what uh, Andy has probably already done, if not yet, he's about to, is make sure that you get the blood out of that femur. The femoral artery has to get the blood out of it. Um, that's like a, a perfect place for pathogens to go hog wild. <laughs> Right? Is it break time? We should pee. Does anybody need to pee? <coughs> Actually, it's uh, it's three o'clock.